I'm going to introduce David Hart in a very indirect and brief manner. Can Professor Hopper please come to the stage? Um, we're very honoured to have Professor Hopper here. Um, and uh, I know he has faith that, that uh, some of us might write something worthwhile in his tradition. But I think, uh, I don't, I think it's unlikely we'll live up to uh, his example. So here's a bottle of wine and a Rothbard tie. <laughs> um, and that, that's on, on behalf of the organising committee, Michael, Sukrit, Washington, Bulukani and Samuel, who all equally importantly contributed to this event. And I don't want Hopper to respond to this, but when I told, when I told Professor Hopper that David Hart was speaking, he immediately told me that he has memories of Rothbard praising Dr. Hart, so I thought you would just repeat what you heard from Rothbard about Dr. Hart. When I, when I met Murray Rothbard um, in 1985, I was familiar with his work, but I did not know him personally. Um, and the first things that we did was uh, going over the names of uh, the libertarian movement uh, and Murray Rothbard always described that the libertarian movement started in his living room uh, and that he could count all of them. And uh, one of the persons that he always, meant that, uh, always mentioned as one of the great talents of the libertarian movement uh, was a guy that I had never heard of, um, David, uh, David Hart. And then immediately I found out that he had written a number of articles in, uh, in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And uh, Murray at that time expressed a certain amount of sadness that uh, David Hart had somehow disappeared from the scene. Um, and I was uh, relieved, so to speak, to find that he has not disappeared from the scene, that he is here. My expectation was that David Hart would be much older than I was because when I came to the United States, of course, I felt that I was a young man and there was already an accomplished guy, David Hart. Um, <laughs> and uh, when people told me David Hart is actually seven years younger than I am, uh, I was simply stunned. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for those uh, very kind words. Um, I um, went to Stanford um, in 1981 and left in 1983. And I got a chance to meet uh, Murray Rothbard and Leonard Ligio, who was an important uh, mentor for me in learning about the history of the French classical liberal tradition. And one reason I left Stanford was I was thrown out of the university uh, because I had uh, irreconcilable differences with the staff over what I would write my PhD on and who would supervise me. And that's why I went to uh, Cambridge. Uh, I found um, not a more welcoming um, place to work, but one that at least tolerated me, whereas Stanford didn't. Um, so that's why I disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, I want to talk to you about um, a relatively unknown branch of the classical liberal family, the f namely the French classical liberals, in particular a, a, a group within that um, school of thought who I call the radical free market classical liberals. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. Um, and I, I, I want the, to bring them to your attention because, A, they're of their intrinsic worth and interest, but they're also, I think, important because they influenced the modern Austrian school, in particular uh, through the work of uh, Leonard Ligio and Ralph Rako, who um, I think introduced Rothbard to some of the more radical French liberals. And that, that's how he became acquainted with their ideas and began to incorporate some of their ideas into his own um, economic and social theory. Um, so here I've got a, a panel of, of images uh, of some of the leading figures, left and right, uh, the French, um, and the central column of the, the stars of the modern Austrian movement. Um, I want to recite to you a poem, and I'm very glad that Viv Forbes mentioned the importance of 
other aspects of the classical liberal tradition apart from pure economic theory and social theory, that we also need to have a strong culture of music and art and film in which liberal ideas are expressed. And um, this is my very crude attempt uh, to write a song that I think Mises would have sung had he been a Beatles fan. And this is based on the Beatles song, Let It Be. And one very natural translation or equivalent of Let It Be is laissez-faire, as the French for Let It Be, allow things to be uh, free. So this is my um, crude attempt at uh, a, a musical tribute uh, to both Mises and the Beatles. And this song is Let It Be, laissez-faire. I won't sing it because that would be very embarrassing. And I'll spare, me, uh, spare myself that uh, embarrassment. When I find myself in times of trouble, Ludwig Mises comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, laissez-faire. And in my hour of darkness, he is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, 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 whisper words of wisdom, wisdom laissez-faire. And when the regulated people living in the world agree, these will be, there will be an answer, laissez-faire. For though they may be ruined, there is still a chance that, I'll, that they'll be free. There will be an answer, laissez-faire. So that's my... Uh, <clears throat> if you go to my website, you can also find my limericks about Frederick Bustier. And Bustier is actually quite a hard name to rhyme with. Um, so <laughs> <clears throat> One of the things that attracts me to the French classical liberal tradition is the richness, both in its economic theory it's social theory, that is, writing of history and a sociology, and also culture. And this is one of my favourite uh, French classical liberal authors, a guy by the name of Jean, uh, Pierre Jean de Béranger. And uh, you have to remember uh, that in the 1830s, uh, it was, there were severe restrictions on organised political movements. Uh, you couldn't form parties, you, you couldn't criticise the government. And so what the French did, being Frenchmen, they would have drinking societies and they would gather together in these clubs which were de facto political groups and they would sing satirical songs mocking the government and government policy uh, in the hope that the, uh, the police would not come and close them down. And Béranger was a best-selling author of these songs um, which were sung in these clubs and he was a member of the Society of Political Economy, would you believe, in the 1840s. So he mixed with the circles of Bastia and Molinari uh, and was uh, at, attended their regular dinners. And now this is a song that was sung in praise of smuggling, which is very interesting. Uh, and the refrain goes like this. And this is a picture from one of the, the illustrated volumes of his collected works, which were published just on the eve of the French Revolution in 1848. And the refrain goes, hang the excisemen, let us get hold of pleasures in plenty and heaps of gold. We have the people on our side. They're all our friends at heart. Yes, lads, the people far and wide, the people take our part. And this is one of the verses. Uh, what tis their will that uh, where one tongue is spoken, where the same laws long time have been obeyed, because some treaty may such bonds have broken, two hostile nations should forsooth be made. So he's saying that artificial borders are caused by governments, breaking apart people who share the same language and culture and have traded for years and years. So free trade is, or smuggling is just another form of free trade. Um, across these artificial national boundaries. And uh, I won't go any further because I, I won't have time, but this is the sort of the cultural side of the French classical liberal movement which I think is very interesting and which in, to some degree is missing from the modern libertarian movement. Uh, we do not have the same um, degree of influence on popular culture that the French had, the French liberals had in their day in the 1840s and, and, and so on. And it's interesting to think how we might expand our reach to continue to develop our economic theories, our social theories, but also to influence the way in which um, uh, people who create works of art might sh share, come to share our views and express some of those values in their creative work. But I'll, I'll come to that again at the end of my talk. Um, something that I wanted to just talk about briefly is um, why the French classical liberal is important, what makes the Austrian school Austrian, it's a very interesting question. And what makes the French classical liberal school Austrian? I think there are many Austrian aspects of the liberalism that developed in France in the 1830s and 40s. And I would like to just explore some of those very briefly uh, today. 
A couple of websites that you might want to look at. This is my own personal website, davidmhart.com, where I have a lot of uh, material about the French classical liberal tradition. I have also a lot of work on art and po the politics of art, um, which you can, if you're interested in what I've said today, you might want to follow, follow the, some of those up. I'm the um, director of the Online Library of Liberty Project for Liberty Fund, and we have over a thousand uh, books in the classical liberal and free market tradition online, free of charge, uh, fully searchable, and we have a sizable Austrian collection. Um, we're in the process of, of, of publishing our own version of the complete works of, uh, of Ludwig von Mises. Um, and they're also available on this Portable Library of Liberty DVD. This is a data DVD with uh, over a thousand texts in PDF, EPUB and Kindle. And uh, these are, we give these away for free. I've given away 25,000 of them so far. If you want one, please uh, contact me via the website and we will send you one gratis. My current research interests are in, involved in a big project at Liberty Fund in translating the complete works of Frederick Bastia. And um, I, with the, volume, the first volume of that has come out earlier this year. And volume two is in, in production right now. This is the, um, the list of volumes. There'll be six very large volumes, about 3,000 pages, 500 uh, per volume. And I'm the academic editor of that project. Now, as I have said briefly before, I think we need to have a very robust defence of, of individual liberty. And this robustness comes from a combination of strong economic theory that's consistent and radical. And we've heard Hans Hermann Hoppe um, give his very robust and, and rigorous defence of that. We also need a broader social theory. And it's interesting that the masters of the Austrian school, uh, like Mises and Rothbard, were also very keen historians. They wanted to apply their economic and political insights into the writing of a broader social theory, particularly Rothbard with his works of history and class analysis. But Mises also wrote about uh, uh, history and theory and uh, wrote um, a very num interesting number of books about uh, fascism and Nazism in uh, World War II. And I think we also need a third component, which is this cultural dimension. And what I find interesting is that of all the three sort of major classical liberal movements, the English classical liberals of the 19th century, the French classical liberals and, and, and the Austrians, it's the French school which has been ignored and is least known. And I think that's something that we need to remedy because uh, of some of the things that I've already mentioned and I'll give you some more details in a moment. Um, the French liberal school, I think, has been unfortunately neglected, even though it is uh, of considerable worth. It's more radical and more consistent than the English school. For example, the English school got mired in utilitarianism, whereas the French classical liberals remained basically adherence of natural law and natural rights, and that gave them a harder cutting edge in their criticism of the state. They are also um, far more developed in their uh, uh, work on social theory, especially history, and using class analysis to look at the origins of the French state in the medieval period, um, and also um, the way in which Napoleon and the French Revolution had created a new bureaucratic class which had come to power in France, and that was something that they were trying to explore. What's also interesting is the French shared a number of interesting insi economic insights with what became known as the Austrian School and did so in the 1840s, well ahead of the marginal revolution in the 1870s. But unfortunately, because of early deaths, for example, Bastiat died of throat cancer, I think, in 1850, and a number of uh, his colleagues also died too young in the early 1850s. The promise of this sort of proto-Austrian uh, analysis of economics sort of began to diminish. And this was uh, after a promising start. Um, I'd also, um, as I mentioned before, think it's important to study the French because of the influence that they had on, on writers like Rothbard um, through Leonard Ligio's um, interest in the French classical liberal school. Here's a list of some of the key um, French classical liberals I, I, I've come across, which I think are, are noteworthy. Um, I've divided them into generations. The first generation, um, someone like uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, who was writing, he wrote his treatise in 1803, and he developed a particularly unique uh, version of classical liberal political economy, uh, which was a very interesting combination of history, sociology, and economic insight, and he made some important breakthroughs um, in, in his analysis of, of key figures or players in the free market economy, like entrepreneurs. Uh, it's most unfortunate, but also quite amusing that in the first translation of his work into English, entrepreneur was translated as undertaker, <laughs> which <laughs> uh, was not uh, helpful, I don't think. Um, following Jean-Baptiste Say ca came um, a couple of lawyers, Charles Comte and Charles Dunoyer, who took Say's ideas and began to ask themselves, how is it that societies evolve 
and evolve in the direction of freedom. And they began to develop interesting theories of historical development that went through economic stages. So this is like Marxism before Marx. Right? They argued that societies went through various stages like slavery and feudalism and mercantilism and then sort of Napoleonic bureaucratism and that we were now emerging into a, a period of commerce and industry where these would be the predominant forces and which would allow greater economic activity and greater freedom uh, to gradually emerge. And Comte and de Noyer based their sociological and historical analysis very deeply on um, Jean-Baptiste Say's economic writings. And then we have the historian Augustin Thierry, who um, is one of the extremely important um, historians to apply these classical liberal notions uh, to the writing of particularly medieval history. The second generation who come after um, uh, Say and Comte and Dunoyer are the period of, is a, a group of men who I think really pushed the limits of French classical liberal thinking in, wholly, in completely new directions, in sort of Austrian directions. Um, and this group is, a, uh, one of the leading figures is Frédéric Bastiat, another younger man called uh, Charles Coquelin, um, Jean-Gustave corcel senoy very little, little known uh, his, uh, economist, and then Gustave de Molinari. And what's interesting that this is a clustering of figures who came together in the 1840s. And I, I describe the 1840s as a kind of anarcho-capitalist moment in history, where a number of thinkers began to think the unthinkable, beginning with someone like uh, Molinari in 1846 and then in 1849. He says, what if we apply economic analysis to everything, even what the government does? What if we look at all kinds of monopoly in a critical fashion, including the government provision of security? Right, just by asking this question, he un, um, uh, invites all sorts of radical conclusions. And he came to the conclusion that everything can be analysed in, in economic terms. All monopolies are bad, whether they be government or private. And that we should, uh, economists should now begin to think about how these previously monopolised institutions or activities could be done privately. And he comes up with the notion of insurance companies uh, offering their services for protection on an open competitive market and trying to envisage what sorts of solutions would emerge from this free market in, in the production of security. And he invents that expression in a, in a famous essay. We also have another sort of Austrian or anarcho-capitalist moment with the author Charles Cochlear. He's, he's another one who dies far too early, 1852. He, in 1846 and 1848, begins to think about the policy of free banking. <coughs> Again, another government institution that might be exposed to competition, to uh, pri uh, free entry of competitors, offering free market currency, which will be d the value of which and the uh, widespread use of which would be determined by c purely competitive forces. Now, all of this is happening between 1846 and 1856. So it's a very interesting historical question is why is this happening now? And I think it's partly because of the terrifying rise of socialism in France in the 1840s, the radicalization of the political economists in France by the 1848 revolution and the first experiments in creating a welfare state with a program like the National Workshops, which was a government program to um, have unemployment insurance. Uh, and Bastiat fought this bitterly when he was the vice president of the um, uh, financial committee of the uh, constituent assembly to which he was elected. So all these things come together in a very um, uh, rich and interesting way in this 10 year period. And then, then they get uh, dispersed through early deaths. Molinari is forced to flee to Belgium uh, because of the rise to power of the, the dictator Napoleon III who doesn't like this radical wing of the free market uh, group. So this is a sort of a, a, a flourishing that doesn't quite see um, fruition. And uh, it's, it's, it took another 100 or so years before people like Rothbard began to pick up some of these ideas and develop them further. These are some of the key texts from this uh, incredible period of, uh, between 1846 and 1856. But if you ask yourself you know, how, exactly how Austrian were these French, ra this radical group within the French political economy movement. And they were, you have to remember that they were a, a faction within a larger group.
group. That not all the French economists were as radical as Molinari and Coquelin and others, but they were a very vocal and they were a very innovative and very creative uh, group of people within this broader movement. And if you look through a checklist of what um, ideas sort of define what modern Austrianism is, um, I looked at Peter Bertke's article in the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics to come up with the number of this, this checklist here. The science of economics, um, he says Austrians believe that only individuals choose. The study of the market order is fundamentally about exchange behaviour and institutions within which exchanges take place. Proposition three, the facts of the social sciences are what people believe and think. In microeconomics, utility and costs are subjective. The price system is a way of transferring information about supply and demand and, and so on. Private property in the means of production is a necessary condition for rational economic calculation. The competitive market is a process of entrepreneurial discovery. And then in macroeconomics, money is not neutral. Right? It's, uh, it has political consequences and economic consequences. The capital structure consists of heterogeneous goods that have multi-specific uses that must be aligned. And Proposition 10, social institutions often are the result of human action and not of human design. And if you go through the French classical liberals, you can ask yourself uh, how many of these ideas or concepts were they um, exploring or had they come up with or had they never heard of? And this is my attempt to try and um, come up with a sort of scorecard of how Austrian were these French economists. With this notion about only individuals choose, this is very strongly advocated by these French liberals. Right? They, they are finally focused on individual activity as property owners, as traders, as entrepreneurs. Uh, that is their focus. Proposition two, the study of the market order is fundamentally about exchange behaviour. For Bastiat, that was the most important thing, exchanges uh, between consenting adults. What they did not come up with was proposition three, the facts of the social sciences are what people believe and think. This was the radical aspect of subjectivism which comes from um, the um, 1870s, um, the marginal revolution. So the scorecard out of the science of economics is two out of three the French liberals were exploring. In microeconomics, proposition four, utility and cost is subjective. This is quite strongly supported by people like Bastiat in particular. And he was increasingly moving in this direction, seeing that all exchanges are really exchanges of service for service, um, which is his, I think, groping towards this idea of subjective costs and individual subjective cost. The price system economises information. They sort of half came to that conclusion, um, but they did not see um, or recognise the, the role of prices as transmitters of information, which was one of Hayek's great inven in inventions. Proposition six, that private property and the means of production is a necessary condition for rational economic calculation. I would say half they agree with this. The French school recognised very strongly the importance of private property, but not as a way of rational economic calculation. That was not a concept that they had, uh, had developed at that time. The competitive market is a uh, process of entrepreneurial discovery. Again, half yes. Based in the, tr the say tradition, they were very sensitive to the role of the entrepreneur, uh, but did not understand his role as a, uh, a way of uh, 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 inaugurating a process of discovery. So in this uh, group of uh, four, I say that the French were got 2.5 out of four in terms of how Austrian they were. In macroeconomics, money is non-neutral. This is definitely um, part of the... Uh, their agenda. Cochlear in particular and other advocates of free banking recognised that banking had become politicised by being monopolised by the state. Proposition 9, capital structure, they had no idea about capital structure. Right? That was beyond them. Proposition 10, social institutions are often the result of human action but not of human design. And I would say they were very strong advocates of this view. They understood exactly what the free market did and the, nat the natural harmony of, of, of economic activity. Um, was very crucial to this, uh, this, this, their version of this uh, idea. So I give them an overall score of uh, six out of ten. Four out of ten, largely well, they largely agreed or shared Austrian insights. Uh, four out of ten uh, partly agreed or had just uh, certain solutions to the, similar solutions to the problem. So I like to um, use a, a, a unit of measurement, and if you use utils as a measure of utility as some economists do, I want to have a unit of measurement called the Austro. And I would say that the French economists 
Um, just over half an Austro, six out of ten. Uh, that would be my ranking of how Austrian the French were. In terms of social theory, uh, that's, I think, one of the great strengths of the French classical liberal school, say, compared to the English classical uh, school of political economy. The richness of their history writing and their um, sort of beginnings of sociological analysis, where they look at class analysis and the structure of the state and the various vested interests who come to control the state and how they behave. They're particularly interested in, as I said, Napoleonic bureauc bureaucratisation and how bureaucrats get uh, vested interests and selfish interests. In that sense, they're not just Austrian, but they're also proto-public choice, which is very interesting. Um, so they had an idea of exploitation. They have an idea of the theory of history. Um, and these are things that Austrian, uh, modern Austrian economists, particularly uh, Mises and Rothbard, also shared. So I would, I would argue that the French classical school uh, do share these other aspects, not just in economics, but in, in the development of social theory. And I have a, another checklist here, but I think I'm running out of time. So I won't go through this very strongly, except to say uh, that I, I have another score here. Um, overall score, five out of six. So they're sort of more Austrian in the broader social theory and history um, and, uh, and sociology than they are in pure economic theory. So I give them a score of five out of six, or nearly a full Austro, if we want to use my, my measurement. But where the French liberals really excel, I think, is not just combining economic and, and sociological analysis, but also the impact that they had on the broader French culture. And if I would have any criticism of the modern Austrian school, is this is an area which has been relatively neglected. And I think, unfortunately, uh, so. This is just a, a brief sampling of some of the rich um, cultural responses that people who had classical liberal ideas, drawing upon these ideas and then expressing it in artistic ways. Now, this is one of my favourite paintings, not just because she's bare-breasted, although that's always a, an attractive feature. But this is Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People at the Barricade of 1830. So this is a, a, a painting celebrating a revolution that threw, threw out the Bourbon monarchs and introduced what they hoped would be a new constitutional monarchy in 1830. And we see, um, again, people being shot, uh, have, having fallen at the barricade, and Liberty rallying the French people um, for another assault on tyranny. Um, and Delacroix is, in fact, uh, uh, had many, many um, friends who were classical liberals and shared some of their views um, and expressed them in, uh, in, in paintings like this. But Delacroix also um, was a cartoonist. And this one of the, the things that really stimulated the French classical liberal tradition uh, was policy of censorship in the um, restored monarchy after the fall of Napoleon in 1815. There was very heavy press uh, censorship. And classical liberals, including artists like Delacroix, would um, draw these extremely funny and clever cartoons, mocking the censors. This one is called um, The Censors Moving House, or The Censors Sent Packing. And we see um, in the top left-hand corner the building in which the um, censors live, and there's celebration by the people that the censors have been thrown out, they've been put on a cart, the cart is being uh, driven by this uh, moth-eaten looking donkey, and the devil is taking them all to hell in this, in this wagon. And you can see the little um, winged creatures. They're actually pairs of scissors, which the censors use to cut out the offensive passages in a book. And they're all taken flight and they're going off into, a, you know, away from uh, the censors' office. And it was this uh, very interesting um, tradition of political cartooning which uh, is, which attracts my attention, and I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing this. Now, here's one of my favourite authors. He's again is a classical uh, liberal, and he, by the name of Honoré Daumier, and he was actually sent to prison for some months for doing this. Um, Louis Philippe had the unfortunate physical characteristic of looking like a pear. Uh, his physical shape was pear-like, which of course meant that the cartoonists would draw him as a pear, and he would ban this which only stimulated them to do more cartoons of him looking like a pear. And this is Dormier's um, uh, image of the state as a tax eater. So clear understanding of how the state functions as a predatory, parasitic organism. organism. Um, and many, for many people, tax, governments were seen at this period as being tax eaters. And, and this is Dormier's attempt to literally show this. 
So we have a group of people in the right-hand corner who are ordinary peasants, producers, farmers, whatever, and they're being forced to pay their taxes, and they are, have come to um, this tax collection point, and there are these government uh, uh, flunkies with uh, wicker baskets. People put their, their gold coins, silver coins, into the baskets, and the baskets are carried up into the mouth of Louis Philippe. And um, he's not just sitting on a chair, he's sitting on a commode, which I think is the f polite French uh, expression for a toilet. And so what goes in has to come out, and what comes out at the bottom of the commode are benefits and subsidies and privileges. And there's a group of uh, people collecting all these uh, products of um, the uh, monarchical digestion and um, running off to the Chamber of Deputies to uh, celebrate there. Now, as I said, uh, Dormier was put in prison for this, uh, which didn't stop him from drawing uh, Louis Philippe in this way in, in the future. I've already told you about Béranger. He was um, a, a mixed in political economy circles. He was part of the dinner club group that met every, uh, every month. Uh, he knew Molinari and Bastia and uh, wrote some wonderful, wonderful songs and poems. When we compare the successes of the French in this cultural dimension and compare that with the Austrian and the free market school, I think we've got some catching up to do. And the, the examples that I could think of here was the penetration of our culture by free market ideas is, is I think, less, uh, interest, less satisfactory. I was thinking of the novels of Ayn Rand. They were very successful, and many of us uh, began our intellectual journey uh, because of her ideas. The film that was released this year, I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's I describe it as B grade across the board. That's uh, about the best I can say about it. A much more successful and sophisticated and clever uh, uh, sort of cultural product with, with free market ideas is my favourite TV series, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, which is every episode was like a lesson in public choice economics. And how that became made and how the BBC came to show it is just mind boggling. I just don't understand why they would do that since it was an attack on their very existence. Um, then, of course, we've had, in recent times, the success of Russell Roberts' uh, Hayek rap videos that have done very well on YouTube, which is a very interesting attempt to try and get Austrian ideas out into a broader public in a, in a fashion that will be appealing to younger people. Um, but where is our Austrian cartoonist like Dormier? We don't have one. I mean, occasionally you find cartoonists who come up with Austrian insights uh, but very rarely. This is a picture of Atlas Shrugged. I think he's embarrassed and he's just hiding his face from the movie. Um, this, yes, Prime Minister, the, the image from the rap video. This is, um, if Bastia had been a cartoonist, this is the cartoon he would have um, drawn. Right, here we have a cartoon of Barack Obama creating jobs, right? He's knitting a sweater which has got the word jobs on it. And he's knitting away, and the sweater is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More and more jobs are being created. All right, this is the scene. Bastiat's famous story about the seen and the unseen. But where does this come from? <laughs> right, it has to come from the private sector. Right? A guy wearing a private sector sweater is having his uh, sweater unraveled by this. Uh, and so you, that's what you don't see. You don't see this, the, pay, the payments and suffering that people who have to pay the taxes. This is what the cartoon looked like when it was put together. So if Bastia had been a cartoonist, this is what he would have done. But we don't have very many free market, certainly Austrian uh, cartoonists who might, uh, might do that. So my conclusion is that I think we, to have a radical or a, a, a robust theory of, the, uh, of or defence of liberty, we need to have three things. We need to have rigorous and radical economic theory. We need to have a broader social theory of history and sociology. We also need to have a cultural representation of these ideas to appeal to a broader uh, uh, public. But we also need it to keep our own spirits up. And I think that's something that Ron and Viv were, were stressing as well, that we need to mock the government and the, uh, the bearers of government power to expose them for what they are and to have some fun in doing so. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.